good to see you. Um, this is BDF Virtual Design Festival Screen Time for today, sponsored by Enscape. Uh, and you are Mariam Kamara of Atelier Masomi uh, from Niger, but you're not actually calling us from Niger, I don't think. No, I'm actually in the US right now where I ended up getting stuck. Um, I was not able to make my way back to Niger before our borders closed. And what were you doing in New York I'm, I'm, to get stuck there? Yes, I'm near Boston, Providence, um, and uh, I actually split my time between the two. So roughly half the year I'm here, the other half I'm in my office in Niger. So I just kind of, you know, go back and forth throughout the year. And we met once before very briefly. Do you remember it was um, yes. before Christmas? <laughs> yes. Tell us about that, that, um, that amazing event at the, Royal, at the Royal Academy. Oh, it was, it was so overwhelming actually. <laughs> it was just one of, one, of, one of those events, you know, where there's just so much going on. And then the, you know, the project that we were talking about was just so incredibly important for me. You know, I had just finished working on it. And so it was, it was quite an um, overwhelming experience, you know. So, so for people who don't know what we're talking about, it was the it was the Rolex Mentor and Protégé program, and uh, the mentor was David Ajay, and you were the protégé, and you were presenting your your cultural centre for Niamey, which uh, is that your hometown? It's the capital of Niger, but is that where yes. you're from? Yes, yes. This is that's this is where I grew up most of my most of my youth, I guess, until I graduated from from high school, and then was um, fortunate enough to um, attend university in the US afterwards. And, and I know you're going to give us a presentation in a minute about, about your architectural process, but tell us a little bit about yourself and about your practice. So I, as you mentioned, you know, I run a practice in Niger called Atelier Masumi, and um, it's, it's a young practice, um, fairly small, and we tackle projects mostly in Niger right now, but also um, in the region. Um, there are a couple of opportunities that we're working currently on, and we tend to focus on really figuring out, you know, how to um, translate, you know, particularly for me, an education that I have acquired in the US, you know, um, grappling a lot with the idea of how do you make architecture for that context that is completely different, that has a different culture, different history, that has its own architectural legacy, and how do you really, in a way, almost shed what you learn and create new systems of knowledge and create an architecture that really, um, strikes to the heart of where it's placed, no matter where that is. And um, I was reading in your biography that you were previously a software developer. How did you <laughs> tell us about being a software developer and how did you then move into architecture? Because that's not a usual route into the practice. I've been trying to forget that part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's in the biography you sent us, so. I know, I know it is because it was actually a big chunk of my professional life. Um, I was a software developer for many, many years, you know, in corporate America and working at startups, you know, in New York and um, worked later on in Seattle and all that. But I wanted to be an architect since I was a teenager, really. Um, but again, this is one of those things where, you know, I think when, when you come from the African continent, often you feel that if you have to go, you know, have an education, in particular an education that's not necessarily free, um, elsewhere, you know, there's kind of this feeling that you need to do something um, more in the sciences with it, you know, so either be a doctor, you know, or an engineer or something like that. So I did not feel that I had the right, in a way, to pursue a creative career. So I never pursued it back then. So I decided to be a software developer because I had some interest in um, engineering and some interest in computers. And I thought, well, you know, why not? But I quickly, well, not quickly, sadly, not quickly enough. After almost 10 years down that path, I, uh, stopped everything, went back to school, got my architecture um, diploma and started practicing immediately. Now we have to talk about the, the context of what's been going on in America for the last several yeah. weeks now. Um, as a black architect in America, educated in America, how has that impacted you? What are your thoughts on that whole, the you whole know, Black Lives Matter? The, the sadness of it, it's that I think for us, you know, for black people, well, definitely for me, um, this is this is something that's nothing new, right? But this is something the only the thing that's new right now is that, in a way, black people are finally being believed, because this is something that we've been talking about 
all of our lives, all the time. This is something we know to be true. This is something that happens on a daily basis. And this is something that we have to think about as we navigate the world on a daily basis, the minute our foot, you know, set outside the door. And so, but the, the, the fact that it's kind of taken this global dimension for the first time ever, um, I'm trying to be really hopeful that this means that we've come to a turning point. Um, and I really, really hope that this is true because the outrage we've had also before, right? And so this is really a hope. This is, for me, it's a time of hoping and really kind of not dropping this ball and just making sure that this time around, we really get it right and that we're able to um, turn a corner, so to say. And, and um, to, your, to your question also about being a black architect you know, in the US, I mean, already architecture is such a marginalizing um, field. You know, it's, it's very male dominated. It's definitely very Eurocentric, both in its education, both in its focus, both in its, you know, the platforms that it, it gives people. So I'm really hoping that this is a, a turning point for people to start realizing that, you know, that diversity is a positive thing and that actually having these multiplicity of, um, of voices of different types of work and sensibilities can really actually bring something positive to global culture in general, definitely to architecture specifically. And a diversity of people is one thing, but what about diversity of approaches to architecture? Because I guess the, the canon of architecture is, is very Western, it's very white, very based in European tradition. Um, is, is there an alternative African approach to architecture that's emerging or that has been ignored for centuries, maybe? Well, I think, I think really what has happened, um, which I find a bit violent almost, um, is that architecture is being taught as though literally no other place but Europe has had a history. You know, when I remember going to architectural school and looking for books on world architecture and, you know, I, and I routinely come across books that maybe, you know, spent 10% at most of the book was on the rest of the world's architecture. And then for 90% of that book, it was only Europe and America. And even that is just 500 years worth, which is, which was always astonishing for me. What about Africa? What about Asia? What about, you know, South America, you know, that were along and had amazing civilizations and architecture for thousands of years. So it's something that, in, especially for me, you know, coming from Africa, knowing my history, knowing, you know, living actually in the architecture that is pre-colonial, you know, and all that, it was just unbelievably shocking to experience. And so then, you know, now in the 21st century, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm hoping that we're starting to know better, but the reality is that all of our knowledge base is Eurocentric, as you, as you pointed out. All the books only focus on, you know, it's like the, it, you almost feel as though nothing happened before the Renaissance, right? <laughs> you know, so there was like Rome and, you know, and Greece a little bit and Egypt a little bit. And then there was a the Renaissance. There was nothing in between. And then, you know, so that, that, that diversity is absolutely mandatory. And it's, it's made it ex incredibly difficult um, for me when I was starting in the beginning to work in a place like Niger particularly because I was not necessarily interested in copying something that had been taught in school and just you know, making that almost like a sculptural exercise in a way. Um, and it really made me also aware of this complete um, confusion that exists in architecture between you know, mod mod modernization um, or contemporary architecture versus Westernization or kind of like this Western culture and div div in a way um, separating I don't, I don't think people realize how intertwined and not separated, you know, these notions, the aesthetic of um, development almost and the aesthetic of modernization, you know, and contemporary architecture has everything to do with European culture and European climate. And therefore it means that we cannot transpose it and transplant it, at least we shouldn't elsewhere. So for me, this has been really an exercise of trying to figure out how to free myself from all this and how to really develop a language and a process more, more specifically that allows me to um, actually make designs that almost ignore a lot of what I, I was uh, taught, um, and, but that get to the truth of a place, to what the place really needs. 
I think that sounds like a perfect cue for you to show us your share your presentation with us. Yes, I think I, I, with everything going on, I really did not want to focus so much on showing, you know, images of the work, you know, a lot of it is online. So, you know, it's easy to, to go get. But I think it really has allowed me to reflect on why I'm doing what I'm doing and how we go about doing it. And what I was really interested in was talk, talking about the process we go through um, in order to do an architecture that for me is much more represent, representative um, of its place. Um, and is trying to shed kind of the legacy, I guess, the colonial legacy that um, our spaces tend to to come to come with. So I guess I'm gonna try to share my screen. To go through just I just prepared just um, a few slides um, to kind of walk you through um, one one of the That's things it. that we tend to do. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Um, the most important thing I think we do, and this I do for all kinds of projects, whether it's um, whether they're cultural projects or even housing projects, um, I got into the habit of having these workshops and these conversations, you know, with um, people in, in in Niger or in the city of Niamey, to kind of try to understand a bit more what the place needs um, and what is in the minds of people. Because for me, architecture is really focus or a field that should be about people, even though we're making it about these wonderful images and they're wonderful and that's great. But at the end of the day, it's for someone to inhabit. So if you don't understand what that someone needs, then how can you make the space that is relevant to them? And um, again, if what you've learned was to make these buildings that even their program really is completely um, absurd if you try to place it in a, in a place like Niger, then all of a sudden you almost have to start from scratch. And what that means for us is um, I've, I, I've, I've been doing these workshops, um, particularly with teenagers, because I really feel like if you want the truth, you should start with young people. You know, they don't have so many preconceived notions about how things, how things should be or the way in which they should frame, they, they should frame um, their world. Um, for the outside world, it was just much more honest that way. And so, for example, one thing that we do is that we would give them cameras. So this I did when I was working on a project um, that had to do with navigating the city and particularly the place of women in it, where I would just ask them to photograph um, street scenes on their way to school or you know back home or something like that, just to see what their eye would catch. What is it that they thought was important? What was, you know, what was kind of, um, uh, what grabbed their attention? And then it also allowed us to have images where we could see then, you know, for example, in this image where we, we've kind of um, doctored the image a little bit to color in where all the women could be seen on this particular street, for example, because the project had to do with how women navigate the street. So it also allows us to have data in a way um, to analyze where we can, we can kind of get a sense of what's happening in the environment. Because this is something that's very difficult when you yourself are navigating on your own, you have your own biases and your own ways of looking at things. So it was, it's been incredibly valuable to have their look, to really see their space through their own eyes and what they choose to capture and not capture. And then one thing that we do is um, this was for um, I was working on a multifamily housing you know project. So I had you know some fourteen year olds you know draw um, their environment. So I just asked them to, to draw their home, and from things like these you know it, it gives us an incredible um, look into even their psyche in a way and how they see themselves and how they see the environment. One thing that we noticed, for example, in this one is that no one, it was very rare for people to draw just their house. They would draw a neighborhood, which again, you know, goes really to the, um, to the heart of the fact that in many African cities, you know, in many African cultures, community is more important than nuclear family or individual, you know, interests and things like that. So it was really about seeing or confirming really through the drawings 
the place of the rest of the community in this drawing shows you know at soccer you know the, the, the soccer field you know on, on the right hand side there are all these subdivisions that are supposed to be these other houses and the gates and you know and then you see inside someone's courtyard you see the importance of water you see you know the tree under which you know that provides shade in a country like Niger where it's 45 degrees celsius one thing that we noticed was like wherever there was this tree the tree was always really important in the in the drawing um that they showed so again that gives us a cue in terms of you know climate and the importance of thermal comfort for a place like that that's so harsh um and really allowed us to understand what was more important and what was appreciated in their daily lives of their home um, for themselves. And then, you know, we also do small essays, you know, where we just ask them, you know, for example, this one where um, this young man was, was talking about his neighborhood and talking about this particular tree that was planted. Sometimes really profound things happen. Talking about this tree, I'm just gonna translate real quick because it's in French. Um, this tree that was planted in his neighborhood, that's called, the neighborhood's name is Freedom. And the tree was planted at, um, at the eve of independence of Niger. And the tree is still there. And this is something that is very important to him in his neighborhood as a marker and as really kind of like a, a sign of identity. Um, and then we, we realized that even when we asked them, for example, to draw their ideal house, we, were, we would be very surprised because you can make a lot of assumptions as an architect in terms of what would be ideal for someone or what, what signifies progress, you know, um, and what is it that someone is really looking for. So one thing that, that, was, that would be ubiquitous, for example, obviously everybody wants a pool, once again, because it's really hot. <laughs> so, and that's fine. But then you start realizing that there are certain things that are very cultural that remain. So a lot of people wanted a house made out of stone, for example, even though in popular belief, people want concrete, because it's supposed to be more durable than earth, you know, which is a, a, a material that we work with a lot. But they were talking about stone. They were talking about things that would stand the test of time and that would really be around for, you know, for generation and generation. So there was also this, this notion of pride and identity of place and kind of marking, you know, your, your, your place somewhere. And this, this is kind of a, a, a bit more of that, you know, when they, they're talking a lot about vegetation, they're talking a lot about nature, you know, all of those things um, that we almost take for granted, um, but that you're realizing what is their proper place, you know, depending on what kind of project you're working on. And then when we work on more rural, rural projects, for example, this was written by um, someone in um, a village uh, where, we, where we worked and we were making a new library um, and a community center. And, you know, they were describing their daily routine, you know, and I, I remember where they're on a Friday. So they were kind of saying, oh, you know, tomorrow is Saturday. I'm going to go to the field and plow, you know, our, our family land. And then, you know, I'll come back and, you know, study, you know, it also really gives you kind of this dimension and this, this you know, firsthand um, view into the things that preoccupied them and what is it um, that they're worried about and what is it that they probably will need. You can make a library that is all glitzy and has all kinds of really beautiful things in it. Or you can try to think about how to make the library a place that can accommodate certain things that people would tell you through these conversations in terms of, you know, th th this is actually a session where many people were telling us that they really need a quiet place, for example, that they can, um, that, that can be something of a refuge where they would study because they, they live in really large families, you know, uncle, aunts, cousins, everybody living together. There could be 40 people in a compound. You know, how does a student study, you know, and what's the place of a library in a community like that? So for me, this has been really the absolute most rewarding and absolute most um, important aspect of how we go about practicing and that we tend to do systematically because at the end of the day, you know, I think even what's happening with, um, with COVID, I, I, in a way, both COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement, like both almost equally made me understand the importance of these kinds of approaches because um, with the isolation that COVID has, has generated, for example, it's been really difficult for me to do this, this work <clears throat> when I'm not able to be in Niger. But at the same time, it's really highlighting the, the importance of really looking within for solutions rather than trying to apply something um, that is supposed to be the best the best thing to do or um, the correct 
um, answer that comes from elsewhere. But then at the same time, you know, when we're when we're thinking about Black Lives Matter, when we're thinking about you know um, the 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 racism and the marginalization of black and brown, you know, people all throughout the world. You know, there's also this issue of representation, this issue of, you know, narratives of people that is incredibly important and that is basically being ignored and swept under the rug and considered unimportant to the point where even, I mean, when we talk about any place, um, whether it's Africa or Asia, we're always almost, we're asking the question, as though we're doubting that it's possible to come up with a unique um, approach for each of those places. <clears throat> in a way, the question implies, you know, something of a doubt of, yeah, but is it possible? You know, what does it mean to have, you know, an African city? Well, what do you mean? What does it mean to have a European city? What does it mean to have, it's all the same, but because we marginalize these places, we consider that somehow, I think in the back of many minds, it's as though there isn't really anything there, number one, there's no history, um, or there isn't anything of value um, to, to draw from. So it seems daunting all of a sudden to think about something that is uniquely, you know, based on those places, identity-wise, culturally, architecturally, et cetera. And so that's, that's really all I wanted to share today. Um, because this, this has been basically the greatest gift for me um, in my practice is being able to do, um, to go through this kind of process um, before any work we undertake. So how do you then synthesize the, the, the things that the, the, the people you speak to tell you, the children's drawings, how do you then synthesize that into architecture and how do you avoid building buildings that look like the kids' drawings? Well, I mean, Not that that would be necessarily bad, but... No, it won't be necessarily bad. And, and I think in a way, it really, again, highlights um, the fact that architects often have to wear many hats. You know, in a way, you, you, you feel sometimes as though you're, um, you're a psychologist. You know, you, there's, it, it requires a lot of psychology. It requires a lot of, you know, you do, you, you turn what you get into data, but you also turn it into really kind of um, understanding the psyche of you know the people you're working with and really staying open without having as many preconceived you know ideas as as possible and just accepting what is coming your way i think that acceptance is really the hardest thing maybe sometimes because we have so many um strong held beliefs and notions you know the world is supposed to be a certain way and the world only has this one way of looking at things and of presenting things um, and shedding that is incredibly difficult. And um, so for us, it's really in many, many different, you know, very granular um, way of looking at it. So it's not so much about, oh, we're gonna take all this work and we're gonna turn it into a database of X, Y, and Z, but it's more really taking for every project, analyzing every sentence they write, every drawing, you know, they look at, and sometimes that triggers um, program changes, you know, you know, project, you know, that triggers, um, the way a room ends up being shaped that can even change the, the, the light and, you know, acoustics and, you know, all kinds of different things actually can happen by going through these conversations. And were those drawings and, and um, writings that you shared for all for the same project? No, no, the they, were for, they were for different projects. Um, one of them was for housing. Um, some of them were for some housing projects. Some of them, um, like for example, the last image I showed where they were the young, young girls that I was talking to, it was for this um, project called Mobile Loitering that I did at the end of my studies um, that had to do with the place of women in, in, in the city and how they, they themselves felt walking around the city. And so we ended up having these really long, I mean, hours. It was actually pretty much a full day of conversation where, um, and it was very contentious, you know, among themselves where there were some felt that they really wanted this place, that right to the city was really important for them. And they felt that there was something valuable that they were missing by, by um, feeling limited in their presence in the city while others um, had more distance of, well, actually, no, you know, I'll rather stay home. I'll rather stay protected. I'll rather stay, you know, so it was also very interesting to see all these different perspectives and to see how then we can turn that into a project and navigate these kinds of, um, because I can have my own opinions, you know, about what it should be, but at the end of the day, I'm not making this for myself. <laughs> 
And at what point do you start um, interpreting this into architectural decisions, into, into style, into form? And then how do you then go back to the, the community and present that? Or do you start off with, 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 with a suggestion or do you, do, 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 the, the, what the people are saying is the initiation of that. I mean, process. literally, you know, the project, the project is there, but I don't even pick up a pencil until these conversations happen, if the project permits it, right? And most of the time, you know, we've been lucky enough that we've been able to do it on most projects. And after that, then I can start thinking about the, the architecture, but it's also because I want to, um, shape the program better. That's often, you know, the first place these conversations lead. It's in looking at the program again and seeing what makes sense. And then, you know, the, the, the architecture itself comes from additional things. So it's not only that we do these different workshops and conversations, you know, and drawings, but there's also a huge amount of research that we conduct in the architecture of the place, you know, the pre-colonial architecture, um, understanding cultural usage of space. That's a whole other side of our research. And that can really help inform forms that we end up using. Um, I think style is something that I don't think about too much. Um, for me, I would rather the architecture come naturally through different constraints of the space. So when I'm working in Niger, for example, you know, I work a lot with earth because this is a really arid country. This is a really warm country and it has unique thermal, you know, um, advantages, uh, so which also have unique economic um, implications long term. It's cheaper to build with, but also long term, if you're speaking about a house, um, it's much cheaper to maintain in terms of the cost of electricity, in terms of cooling. So that already, you know, is one decision taken care of. Then you start thinking about how the space space is shaped, again, you come back to climate and to geography, you know, because Niger is situated um, not far from the equator, so there's a blinding amount of light, right? When you're in Europe or when you're in London, you know, you're trying to maximize natural light, you're trying to maximize the heat gain. We do the exact opposite. So that also has an impact on the shape, which is also why it's so problematic to take something that could be done in London and come transplanted in Niger um, when the thing in London is supposed to be, you know, southern facing and, and, and putting all this light and what we're trying to do is control light. So all of these things, you know, these, 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 these workshops are a supplement to a whole bunch of other, <laughs> you know, aspects of our process. Well, I was going to say, because at some point you're going to have to go back to all these people who said they wanted stone and swimming pools and say, well, actually it's, it's earth and there's no swimming pool. So it's very interesting because when, when we have those um, drawings, actually, it doesn't stop there. Then we take it and in the same session, we go over it and we discuss what they talk about and what they drew. And so one thing that we did in this session with the stone houses, you know, and all that is that we, we had prepared some slides and some images and we're showing them all these earth buildings and they were completely shocked because a lot of the earth buildings that they see are in villages. And so their notion was that, you know, this is kind of the material of the poor. This is a material that is not necessarily adapted, you know, in an urban setting. And it was very important for us to give them then additional information because at the end of the day, you can only want what you know. You aspire to what you know. So for us, it's also a great opportunity to provide something to their knowledge base in the same way. It's kind of this exchange. They're adding to our knowledge base and we're doing the same for them. And so we would share all these things that we know about all these earth buildings and that got them very, very excited. So that's also really rewarding because it allows you to see okay, is it really realistic to try to do this? And how would people react? And you get the first hand reaction before you actually even make the proposal and the work. And the other thing that I want to say that's really important, for example, when I was working on the cultural center pro project where we've done a similar session, actually, I was lucky enough that David could, could be there uh, when, when we did these sessions. They were the first ones that I showed this project to as, you know, the design before we went to London um, to present it. Um, David came back to, to Niger again during the mentorship um, 
a, a couple of months before and the project was ready. We had some renderings and things like that, that I could show and we invited them into the office to come in and had a formal presentation. And I have to say that I had never been so nervous in my life. And <laughs> I was much more nervous about present, presenting to them than I was about doing it at the RA. Uh, just to give you an idea, because it was really important that then we show them what we did based on all the information we had to check and see, did we get this right? You know, is this, is this going in the direction that you were imagining that you wanted for yourself? And then, you know, taking in feedback they have and then incorporating that feedback in modifying the project as though they're the clients, basically. And do you find, and this is a question that could apply all around the world, do you find yourself surprised at um, ordinary people's willingness to embrace adventurous architecture. I think it might be easy to assume in, in the UK, for example, that they want brick, they want small windows, mm -hmm. slash windows, they want pitch roofs, chimneys even. Do you, uh, are people, how hard is it to convince people that maybe something that's of our time um, that will also resonate with the architectural community um, be something that they will use and embrace and, and claim as their own? Well, I, I, I think you have to let the work speak for itself. You know, at the end of the day, also, it's, it's on us as architects to put something on the table that is compelling enough, you know, to elicit that, that response. So, for example, when we presented this project, again, you know, my, my audience is them, right? My, you know, the people that I'm trying to make sure are happy or, you know, respond to the work that we do are them. So when we, when we show, when we show it to them, they're, I mean, their first response was shock. You know, they were extremely happy because again, you know, this was a building made out of earth. This was a building, you know, that had certain towering heights, you know, and all kinds of things happening that they didn't even imagine was possible with that material. So that was completely eye-opening um, for them, number one. And number two, they felt that it was something iconic that they could really be proud of. And that, was, that really surprised me because I didn't know that they, they cared about you know, having some kind of iconic symbol, but that would really be representative of their culture and of their realities and would feel somehow while being very contemporary would feel really rooted in its place. And they responded to that immediately and they latched onto that immediately. And the first question we got was, so when, is, when will this be built? Because this needs to happen immediately. So I think as, as you were saying in the beginning, in a way we also underestimate the, the thirst there is for something, I mean, everybody wants to be important, you know, all human beings want to feel like, you know, uh, want to have their sense of worth recognized. And I think architecture is one thing that has been used throughout history to either, you know, elevate people's sense of themselves or crush it. So in the, again, in, in, in terms of like when we're talking about, when we think about colonization and the colonial project and the destruction of a lot of architecture, you know, not, not only in Africa, but in, in other places as well, where, you know, we've had entire city citadels raised to the ground that have vanished. You know, now some of them have been refound and being excavated slowly but surely. Um, you know, people have had the sense that there was nothing there. You know, somehow it's like this bare thing and there was nothing um, before colonization. And these kinds of projects and these kinds of approaches, I think have allowed us to also make our contribution improving that actually, no, we have all of this history and this is also what we can make of it as a contemporary architecture. There's no reason why someone else can make contemporary architecture based on their you know, culture and their climate and their geology. Why can't we, you know? And it's really been that work. And the approach you're describing, I mean, I, presumably it's not a particularly Nigerian, if I've got the word right, approach, because it's, it's, it's no. consultation in a way, isn't it? I mean, you think about it in the UK, Kathy Hawley, Muff, people like that follow a, a similar approach. Maybe it's a more female approach than a male approach. Maybe it's a less egotistical approach. Yeah. That's very interesting, actually. I never looked at it that way. You know, it, it's, it's possible. It's possible. I think for me, it was just as simple as just realizing that I would feel incredibly presumptuous. And on top of that, I'm from there, I grew up there. So I could have assumed that I know everything and I know what they need and I'm just gonna go ahead and, and make it. But I wouldn't do that anywhere, right? I mean, it's, it's incredibly presumptuous to think that, you know, us as architects or me as one person somehow <laughs> has the answer for, for, for everything. So yeah, it's possible. It's possible that gender has something to do with it. Um, for me, it's just unthinkable. 
um, honestly, to just, because otherwise then it's more of a sculptural exercise than it is of a spatial exercise for me. <laughs> and for the spatial exercise, if I'm gonna care about the users of that space, then I need to know who those users are and what they're thinking. Well, this comes at a time that my question comes at a time when it's been noticed that the countries that have had the best response to, to COVID-19 have been won by women, Jacinta Ardern in, in New Zealand, for example, Merkel in Germany. So I think we're all waiting for um, more of the, the feminine approach to, to the way things are run. Um, but um, in in terms of, of, of your architecture, are you are you working only in Africa? Have you got, in Indonesia, have you got projects in America? And, and would you adopt the same approach there? And what are those projects? No, I don't, I don't not, I'm not working on any projects in America right now. I think my focus is very much, I feel like there's just so much to do, you know, um, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa. So we, we have, you know, some projects that we're working on in other countries other than Indonesia um, that are kind of, you know, um, on the way right now. But I think, that's exactly it. My approach is not necessarily because it's in Niger. I think it's very important for any place where there isn't a strong enough representation, there isn't a strong enough scholarship um, related to you know, the, the, the work or you know, architectural scholarship um, for that place. But I think it's important fundamentally as a practice of architecture in general. You know, I honestly see myself, you know, my place as an architect, as being someone that should be to the service of whatever the, whoever the users of my spaces would be. So it's, it's something that no matter where I work, if tomorrow I work, you know, in India, or if I work, you know, in New York, I would definitely want to be able to have the same approach because I've, I have found it to be incredibly rich in the tools that it gives you actually even conceptually, even create creatively in terms of the different ideas that, that can come to mind are much, much more diverse all of a sudden when you open yourself up to all of these different, you know, and again, you know, even in the US, again, you can, you can see many ways in which this could, this could be important. So you can see, you know, in, especially in urban centers, you can see how architecture has been used and urban design has been used, you know, to subjugate communities. You know, we talk about redlining in, in the US all the time when it comes to, you know, racist policies for in, in urban design. There are all kinds of different reasons why this kind of approach is crucial when you're talking about diverse places, places with, you know, marginalization also and lack of representation. Less a little bit about Niger. There was a, a slightly awkward moment, you know, when you were doing the talk at the Royal Academy with, with David, and the question came up about, you know, what's happening in Africa, as if Africa was this sort of homogenous place. It's this <laughs> hugely diverse <laughs> continent. Um, I probably most people wouldn't even be able to identify where Niger is on a map. Yes. I can because I looked it up before. <laughs> tell us, tell us, <laughs> tell us, tell us about Niger. What's happening in Niger? What is what is the the kind of cultural background to the the country, and what is happening now that you would single out as being interesting? Well, I think what's what's happening now for the country specifically is that there's been kind of this amazing economic boom, and you know, um, in in many many different ways, which is not singular to Niger. It's many African countries are, have been going through that for the past decade, thankfully. And so it also means both um, in terms of education, in terms of um, the built environment, in terms of just all kinds of um, different aspects of the economy are, have been greatly improved, which also means that there's a huge growth in the middle class you know, all over the world, which again, for architects has implications you know, in, in the demands on, of, of our services and the kinds of things that we get to do. So it kind of feels Niger very much like its neighbors. It's also going through, you know, maybe it's a millennial effect <laughs> and you know, the internet and social media and all that. There's a huge wave of hope and young people really trying to do things, really trying to um, push the boundaries, you know, re really trying to, yeah, to, to, to figure out new ways forward, you know, of both self-representation, of business, you know, in, in just all kinds of different fields. So I would say that things, things are looking very good, um, particularly considering that a country like Niger, so to set, step back a little bit, which is the case for pretty much all African countries, is an artificial country, right? This is kind of the situation that we have in Africa where we found ourselves 60 years ago 
with these borders and these countries with these names um, that all of a sudden we need to make a nation. So this has been, you know, again, a, an African challenge um, for all of the countries where, you know, creating national identity, creating cohesion has been really difficult, which is why, you know, it's a place of conflict sometimes or, you know, um, a, a lot of other, you know, challenges in, in terms of, um, how people get along, you know, just imagine that all of a sudden, you know, you used to be part of a kingdom or an empire that has been together for a thousand years. And some people come and, you know, draw a line like a Crayola, you know, um, exercise over a weekend. And then now all of a sudden um, you have to be together with these other people that maybe you had been, you have been fighting for 500 years. And then, you know, half of your ethnic group is in this other country. The other half is in this other country. And so it's a place where you very much feel those dynamics. It's a place of incredible, incredible cultural richness, particularly architecturally. You know, and I, we we mentioned that you know when we were in London uh, with David, where I feel I'm incredibly fortunate, you know, as an architect to hail from a place like that. Because again, this is because it's so inland um, compared to the rest of African countries. It was actually spared a lot of the colonial destruction. So we have cities from the 15th century that are still around. You know, we've we've gone on trips. You know, even during the Manchester Strip, also um, in in some of, in some of those towns where we can see the traditional architecture, where you know you you have five, six generations, you know, or ten generations of people who have lived in the same house. You know, made with these you know amazing um, architectural techniques. You know, and all that that we can draw from. And I would say that that's that's really what Niger is. It's just kind of like this, and it's not at all what you imagine as an idea of Africa, I think, you know, often we, we imagine these, um, you know, tropical you know, place where, you know, this is a country that is in the middle of the Sahara Desert, basically, um, which also means that the people look very different than when, what, you know, when imagine either Arabic people, the Nigerian Arabs, Nigerian Tariqs, Nigerian, you know, it's just, there's all kinds of, you know, mixes and hues, and it's a, it's an actual melting pot of, you know, of, um, of Africa racially also. So it's, it's a very, very special place. And again, it's not because I'm biased because I'm from there, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's incredibly rich. And, it's, it's in, and, and I think that's why also I'm, I'm not in a hurry to branch out you know, elsewhere because there's just so much to do there. And there's so much that delights me, frankly, um, that I just keep exploring every time through every project. And just to bring it back to what we we're talking about at the beginning, how can the profession of architecture become more diverse? How can how can the media help that to happen? Are there, are there any positive um, steps that can be taken? Any advice? Uh, what, what what can we do collectively to to make things better? Well, I think this is a process. Honestly, you know, I think it's going to be a process. I think pretending that there's kind of a, a magic bullet is too easy. There isn't. Fundamentally, one of the main problems, right, is that when you have, when you have, um, I mean, we still have a subject and master dynamic in this world, right? So whoever is in the master category has an automatic superiority complex. And that superiority complex then means that automatically, they also think, even when you're trying to help, you think that the answers need to come from you. So I think it's also this realization of that there needs to be a lot of humility and listening more than reacting and really looking at the rest of the world that doesn't look like you or that doesn't look like me um, as other human beings rather than objects to be analyzed or to be you know, discoursed over or to theorize. So I think from, for me, that's been, that's been the most um, difficult thing to deal with is that kind of feeling of being these objects, you know, that you photograph, that you, you know, that you write about. Um, usually the most sordid things, you know, the better that you can find. You know, when I think about, you know, for example, in the press or in the media, you know, sometimes the, 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 uh, the tendency, for example, when you're talking about Africa, the tendency to only focus on talking about questions of war or situations, you know, of, of you know, just some some the most insane things you can possibly find are what you you know what would be written about, and that doesn't do anybody any you know any any service. So I think 
the equality needs to start from within, you know, that feeling of being equal to is the starting point. Because unless that is there, then it's just a veneer. It's just a veneer of, oh yeah, okay, I think we should really do something. This seems wrong. You know, we should do something. But the, the work needs to start inside in really truly thinking that these people are equal to you and that they're really another human being just like you with exactly the same hopes and dreams. We're not a different species, but we're being made to be. It's that simple. So I think once, once it's simplified, then, well, how would you treat someone who's not, you know, black, <laughs> you know, like when you encounter work that is where race or gender doesn't come into the equation, how do you treat it? Well, why is it that it would be treated differently, you know, what, for a different gender or for, for a, a different race? So I think just, it, it comes back to really doing the work to educate ourselves about what's out there and about really accepting what's out there as not being this exotic thing, but as being just one other expression that is different from your expression or my expression, but that's just one other expression. That's really all. And really embracing the beauty of diversity. We have a question for you, Mariam, from Rishab from Nairobi. He asked being, it's quite a long question by the way, Okay. Being a graduate in this confusing time, what would you recommend someone very passionate about vernacular African architecture, but having studied in the West do? Especially since going back home to Kenya after so long, what steps would you state, what steps would you take to start a conversation of a new type of architecture? I, I think again, you know, we have to be very careful when we want to, to start conversations because we have to be careful not to think of ourselves as the, the purveyor of solution. I think it's much easier to just go and listen. You know, for me, that was really more what helped me was that I wanted to know what I should know. <laughs> you know, what is it that I should find out about? What is it that I should learn? Because you have to recognize that there's just a lot to learn that you don't know that your education does not prepare you for. So it's more about going there and uncovering things and not so much going there and teaching things or you know, giving, giving someone, um, because that's, again, that comes back with this, you know, being careful about the superiority you know, feeling. You know, I think often we can feel that because we went to school you know, in a Western country, then maybe then that means that we have something that we have to, to come and offer. And my experience has been the exact opposite. My experience has been like, I had a lot more to learn you know, than anybody else because I went and studied you know, my craft in the US and that all of a sudden I need to learn from local masons, I need to learn from, you know, metal workers and contractors and, you know, all, ki all kinds of people um, that I ended up interacting with. You could have saved a lot of money on your education then. No, not necessarily because at the end of the day, you know, you still learn certain things that are basic, right? You know, technically how to draw properly, you know, all of those things. But when it comes to actually, you know, the form of architecture, and the form of the spaces, then that's a whole other story because that, that's not necessarily, you know, depending on what school you go to, um, even the school's sensibility can make you a completely different type of architect, let alone the country you go to, right? So then you have to learn um, these different aspects, take the tools that are still useful, which, you know, like how, how to properly draw something, how to properly, you know, think through a concept and all that, but then understand that they're only tools and that they are not an answer. Well, Marion, thanks so much. It's been great speaking to you. Um, right. Like you said, your work is on your website, the Atelier Masomi website. Also, we've published some of your projects on the zine. But I think next time, let's see your work. Next time Absolutely. we speak. Happily. Thank you so much. Great to talk. See thanks. you soon. Bye.